Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. By the end of the 19th century, schools were laying down the values and standards of patriotism for the very first time. There was less underemployment, there was more free time, more entertainment, and a new breed called consumers. A new public, this time on the Western tradition. Now UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. Last time I carried the 19th century to 1914 and let me tell you it was a heavy burden to bear to 1914 when it exploded. But I want to go back once more to the 30 years or so before 1914 because, as one Frenchman put it, who was going to die in the first weeks of the war, the world had changed more since he went to school than it had since the Romans. It was in those years, roughly from the 1880s to the outbreak of the First World War, that a radical change began which turned out to be the most profound revolution that the West has ever known. It was then that the great mass of people came to live and even to think like everybody else about whom history has ever been written. For several thousand years, remember, written history was a history of the upper classes, by the upper classes, for the upper classes. The definition of upper classes may have varied a bit, but until the 19th century, literacy was always the perquisite of small ruling groups and their immediate servants, clergy, clerks. The human record kept to the interests and the activities of those who made the record or who were expected to read it. Granted, that record was impressive, but it remained narrow, with the lower classes, that is the immense majority, making only sporadic appearances on the stage of history. That's when one talked about the starving masses, or the suffering masses, or the rebellious masses. The rest of the time, the masses were either out of sight, or else they served as extras for crowd scenes in which only a few characters from the upper classes could be distinguished. The populace provided a local color. And even the wonders of the Industrial Revolution were seldom for the common people, hardly ever for the common people outside the towns. But after mid-19th century, average people began to eat better, to dress a bit less badly, to work a bit more regularly. And they could also admire the material progress around them, the gas lights, the electric lights, and so on. The two nations were still a social reality, but they were evolving into something else, an evolution that was gathering speed. By mid-century, the upper classes were beginning to include the middle classes. And this, in fact, is when the term middle class appears. And the middle classes were expanding in numbers, and they were diversifying as well. 
There were industrialists and bankers and professors, of course, but also a new section of mankind was becoming visible. Shopkeepers, shop assistants, clerks, artisans, civil servants, commercial travelers and mechanics. They were literate now, they had more time and money, and they had become economically and politically significant. But there were still three-fourths of the population who remained insignificant and largely invisible. Most of them were peasants. Even a lot of the workers that we would call industrial, miners, weavers, potters, still lived in villages, still took time off for harvest. In 1850 and 1860, these people still lived very much like their ancestors. Their diet was largely vegetarian because meat was expensive and rare. Now the homes of such people were primitive. Many had no windows because there was a tax on doors and windows. Many families shared their quarters with a family pig or goat or chicken. They shared them with a cow. Many had never seen a town. Very few had seen more than the local market town. They were not part of a market economy, still less of the national economy. For people like these, national politics as we know it were meaningless, something that others did far away. And the nation, what we call the nation, was not a familiar concept. Many people didn't even speak the national language. They spoke local dialects. A lot of the peasants also used local measures as they had done in the Middle Ages. A bushel might mean something very different in a village like this one from what it meant in the village 10 miles down the road. Even the national currency was largely irrelevant because most people handled cash so rarely. They were attached to their village, their valley, their fields. They had a relationship with neighboring communities, with a nearby town. The state was something very vague. The state was related to tax collectors and customs men who evoked a lot of law-breaking and rebellion. It was related to soldiers, to policemen, to all kinds of intrusive forces that made a hard life more difficult. In remote regions, many people didn't even know that they lived in France or Italy. They didn't know what nationality they were. They didn't know what nationality meant. And for a long time, when they got the vote, they voted the way the landlord, the priest, the mayor, the village usurer told them to vote. All this was just beginning to change in Europe a hundred years ago, and this is what I want to talk about in this program and in the next one, the process of social, economic, cultural, national integration. Why it happened, how it happened, and how it affected people's lives. First, why? By the last third of the 19th century, Western Europe was divided into nation states. The theory of the nation state was that all its subjects were citizens, subject to the same law, sharing in the national sovereignty which provided the authority of the state. This meant that they had a say in the making of the laws, at least by electing the legislators. And it meant that they had to understand the laws and the process of election and the process of legislation. So they had to have a common language. A country full of people who couldn't understand each other wasn't a nation. Its people were not fully citizens. If you wanted them to obey laws, pay taxes, serve in the army, 
not reluctantly or resentfully, but freely and willingly, you had to persuade them that this was their country, that the state they served was their state. The first thing to do was to enlarge people's horizons, to show them that their fatherland was more than the village or the valley, more than Brittany or Tuscany or Kent, that it was really this hitherto abstract entity called France or Italy or England. This was going to be done primarily in school. The last third of the 19th century is the time when schooling became public, universal, compulsory and free. There had been school before, of course, and a lot of children, even the children of simple people, had gone to school. And some had even learned something. Some got on in the world. But never before the 1880s were all the children of Western Europe taught to read and write. Even the girls, who hardly ever went to school before. And this was important because it meant that by 1900 or so, all young adults within the territory of a given nation state had acquired a common identity. They knew that they were French or German. They spoke the same language, and this affirmed their identity. The certificate you got when you left school at 13 or so, this replaced First Communion or Confirmation as the symbol of emancipation and growing up. It became a key to getting a job, just at the moment when the modern economy was producing new jobs, new opportunities of social mobility for simple people on the railways, in the post office, the police and so on. If you served in the army, as most young men did, you couldn't hope to become a non-commissioned officer, a corporal, a sergeant, without a school leaving certificate. And for the exceptional boy, we're still talking only about boys, you notice, for the exceptional boy, a good performance in school offered the chance of a scholarship, access to more advanced education, perhaps to the university, from which you could graduate into the lower reaches of the upper classes. But it isn't enough for schools to be there for children to go to school. Schooling is not such a pleasure that children are eager to attend. And parents are not always eager to sacrifice the labor, the earning power of their children in exchange for book learning. As a matter of fact, a lot of parents in the 19th century protested that being forced to send their children to school deprived them of a crucial portion of the family labor and family revenue. Who was going to guard the sheep? Who was going to bring in the extra shilling from their wages? Making schooling compulsory, making schooling free, helped, of course. And it happened at considerable cost because the dominant classes felt that, first of all, national integration was worth the price, and secondly, that a modern industrial society could not operate without a basic level of literacy. But that's what the masters thought, who voted the laws. What about the masses who obeyed them? What about parents and children? For the answer to that, we have to look at the dramatic changes the Industrial Revolution had brought about, especially in agriculture, transportation, and communications. In the second half of the 19th century, the mileage of road and rail soared, not just the main lines, but secondary lines, not just highways, but local roads, country roads. More goods got to the market, more commercial travelers got to the village. The peasant was at last brought into the national economy. 
he had to keep records, to complete forms, to fill in shipping manifests. So he couldn't afford to use a tally stick anymore and just notch up his accounts. He shifted from subsistence to a cash economy. He had to count in the national measures and in the national currency. And this dragged him into the wider world, whether he liked it or not. So eventually, he was glad to have his child go to school, to learn the language in which to deal with officials, to learn how to write and how to reckon so he could write letters and keep accounts, to learn how to read so he could read a will or a contract or even a newspaper for fun. And the child knew that the school certificate was his passport and especially her passport because girls were much more eager to get away than boys. A passport for leaving the village and finding a better life in town. But schools were not only useful and relevant, they also laid down the values and standards of the brave new world. Patriotism and the civic duties that went with it, obeying the law, paying taxes, doing your military service or producing children for it. These first generations to go through school were more law-abiding and more patriotic than any before or since. Indeed, the men who went to war with such enthusiasm in 1914 had been schooled in the 1880s and 90s. Meanwhile, an expanding economy had been attracting and accommodating more people. The peasants were voting with their feet for the dark satanic mills, voting for the alienating cities. They went there in droves because unpleasant and dangerous as factories and cities might be, they were still better than the drudgery and the misery at home on the farm. As these emigrants left, the peasants who stayed behind on the farm were better off as well because there were no longer too many hands for too few jobs. There was also less isolation and the countryside was more integrated in the national economy and the national culture than it had been for centuries. Country folk were beginning to read the papers, penny papers increasingly illustrated, and the trains that delivered newspapers also brought fertilizers for the fields, better materials for building and roofing their houses, and stoves, and dishes, and ready-made clothing. And the young people began to wear shoes instead of clogs, especially at dances where they could now dance to the sound of violins, or even pianos instead of bagpipes. We've seen how city folk of the lower classes started to live like their betters. Now, country folk started to live like city folk. In two or three generations, they would even look like them. And that had never, ever happened before. And what the urban immigrants got in a few years, if they were lucky, now trickled back to the rural world where they came from, so that two-thirds of humanity could start joining the rest. Now, all this was not simply the result of philanthropy and good fellowship, of course. As we have seen with the industrial working class, it was also the result of self-help, organization, unionization. It was the result of access to the ballot, which made politicians try to serve their electors, try to provide what the communities that elected them wanted. Roads, water, schools, credit, and jobs. 
and it was the result of greater productivity, hence lower prices, hence more accessible goods. But you couldn't have had higher productivity if you hadn't developed this immense reservoir, not just of labor, but of consumers. If you hadn't turned potential consumers into actual consumers and enable them to earn the money with which to buy the clothes, the equipment, the small luxuries everybody always wanted but never could afford. So it was a sort of virtuous spiral. The more people you brought into the economy, the more they could buy, the more you could sell. The more you sold, the more you could afford to pay a living wage regularly and even to pay the same wage for fewer hours of work. Through the first half of the century, the English passed a series of factory acts which culminated in 1850 with a great advance, the 60-hour week for women. Since in a lot of places women worked alongside men, this meant a shorter working week for everybody and a half holiday on Saturday. That quickly became known as la semaine anglaise. And this English week of five and a half working days became a major claim of industrial workers in other countries and by the eve of the First World War a major gain. One extra afternoon a week may not seem much to you, but it meant that working class families could enjoy more entertainment on Saturdays and even on Sundays when they were less tired. It meant they could go to the dance hall or theater. And by 1900, they could watch movies invented in 1895 or 96 as a kind of music hall attraction. They also had more time to read the papers and to enjoy the spectacular side of electoral politics, which provided entertainment and spectator sport at a time when entertainment was still rare. So advances in the welfare of the masses, urban and rural, were related to the economy and to the implications of national unity but they were also affected by something a lot less obvious, the new doctrines of evolution and natural selection. In 1859, Charles Darwin, an English naturalist, published a book called On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. Darwin argued that animal species did not originate in a divine act of creation as portrayed in the Bible. They evolved as a result of natural change over time, taking or missing opportunities to adapt to an environment which also changes. In another book he published in 1871, called The Descent of Man, Darwin linked human evolution quite explicitly to the higher primates, specifically and shockingly, as his critics put it, to hairy quadrupeds furnished with a long tail and pointed ears. Life is a competitive struggle for existence, wrote Darwin. Creatures that possess useful characteristics or that develop such characteristics by mutating right are favored in the struggle. And what goes for other animals goes for the human animal as well. And such notions were expressed in a phrase that caught the public imagination, the struggle for existence, or the struggle for life. Darwin himself, of course, went to church as all gentlemen did. 
But Darwin was an agnostic, probably as a result of the fact that he studied to be a clergyman at Cambridge. He saw no higher moral or religious ends at work in evolution, only chance and necessity. Some of Darwin's followers, however, identified evolution with progress. And the general idea of the evolution of species and their struggle for life was quickly applied to nations which also seemed to evolve as living organisms do, struggling for survival and domination. So history could now be interpreted in terms of a struggle for life in which the weak nations went to the wall and the fittest survived. But there was a problem. Industrial surveys and urban surveys, which the 19th century adored, along with the statistics that the new conscript armies and the new public schools provided, all these suggested that industrial nations were terribly unfit. A high proportion of the population was sickly, twisted, underdeveloped in body and in mind, generally botched. And you had to do something about that. Christian charity said so, and Christian charity was very big in the 19th century, but now national interest spoke more loudly still, as we shall see in our next program. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.